Computer Delivered IELTS, brought to you by, Knowledge Island by Bilal. Change the volume using the bar in the top right corner. Click Continue when you hear the sound clearly. Before we continue, please subscribe to our channel, and press the bell icon to get more updates. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between the manager and a customer in a restaurant. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good afternoon, Delano's Restaurant. How can I help you? Hi, can you tell me how late you're open at weekends? Yes, of course. On the weekends, including Friday night, we're open till midnight. OK, that's great. Do you take reservations? Of course. Let me just get a reservation form. So, first of all, can I have your name, please? Sure. My family name is Matteo. That's M-A-T-E-O? Yes. And your first name? It's Kirsten. Uh, was that Kristen? No, I'll spell it for you. K-I-R-S-T-E-N. Ah, sorry about that. No problem, I'm quite used to it. OK, I'll just run through all the details about the booking with you. But before I do that, I'd better get your contact number now, just in case I forget to do it later. Is that OK? Sure. It's area code 734, and the number is 677-8111. OK, so when would you like to book? Next Friday. As in the 7th, correct? Yes. At 8 p.m. if you have room for us. Let's see. How many people are you booking for? We've got, let's see, three couples, my brother too, and my parents, of course. So that's nine adults. And is it all right to bring infants? Yes, that's no problem. We have special seats for them. Actually, we'll have two coming. But don't worry, they're well behaved and they'll probably sleep the whole time. They won't need seats. Fine. Just bear in mind that it might be quite noisy in the restaurant at that time. Oh, that's cool. We just want the whole family to be there together for the dinner. Is it a special occasion? Yes, it's my parents' wedding anniversary. 35 years together. That's fantastic. OK, so to make sure that everyone has a great time on this special day, I'd like to discuss our food options now, so that we can be prepared. OK, great. I've heard great things about your menu. Yes, you definitely won't be disappointed. Now, is there anyone in the group who has special dietary requirements? Oh, yes. Both my sister and brother have an allergy to nuts. Um, we usually just avoid them altogether. We like to try each other's dishes and it makes it easier. Right, that's important. I'll just make a note of that. Oh, don't worry. They'll remind you for sure. Oh, one more thing I almost forgot to mention. 
My father's recovering from surgery, and for the time being he's in a wheelchair. Are there any stairs or anything that could make it difficult for him? Good question. We do have stairs outside, but we also have a ramp. It shouldn't be a problem at all. We'll make a special place for him at the table. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. If you want, you can place your orders now, while you're on the phone. Well, I think everyone will want to make their own choices. But it might be nice to have a few starters prepared in advance. May I suggest some of our salads? We have a great white bean salad and another with basil and tomatoes. Oh, well, they sound good, but... Uh... Or... How about our famous stuffed mushrooms? Yes, those sound good. Could we have them? And maybe something with bread. Do you make your own bread at the restaurant? Yes, our bread is fantastic. Fresh from the oven. We serve that with our homemade pesto, if you think you'd like that. Hmm, what else is there? Well, for something a bit different, you could try our salmon fritters. They always get good reviews. Yeah, they sound nice. OK, those two will do. And everyone can decide if they want salads or bread when they get there. Wonderful. I'll just write that down. Right, so is there anything else that we can do to make the celebration more memorable? We often do special cakes for these kinds of occasions. Well, Dad isn't supposed to eat much sugar, so... What about decorations? Could you set up some balloons or something like that? Absolutely. We've done that kind of thing before. And I don't suppose you have live music. We could request that the band sings their favourite song. Unfortunately, they only play on Saturdays and Sundays. But we can try to make the music special. I'll tell you what, if you can create a CD of their favourite music, we can play it during part of the dinner. Yes, that'd be fantastic. They'll love it. And we'll have a special gift as well. Thanks, that all sounds wonderful. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear the Human Resources Manager talking to new employees about the rules in the workplace. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello and welcome. I'm going to give you a brief induction to working with us at Compass Construction. First, I'll be covering basic health and safety requirements. Next, information about timesheets and pay, and some guidelines around workplace behavior and dress codes. Finally, I'll finish by explaining our emergency procedures. Right, health and safety. As your employer, we have an obligation to take all reasonable steps to ensure your safety at work. This is our responsibility by law, and we take it very seriously. But you also have responsibility for your own safety. That means you're required to follow safety requirements and keep yourself and others safe. Employees who fail to do so will receive formal warnings. So, 
What happens in the unlikely event that you or someone else is hurt, or almost hurt, at work? Report it. A serious accident. Report it. Stub your toe. Report it. We also require employees to report near misses. A near miss being a fancy way of saying an accident waiting to happen. Almost slipping on a wet floor, for example. It's important to report near misses because if you don't, someone could get hurt next time round. So, the incident report forms are kept at reception. Linda will show you how these need to be filled in and filed. Ah, if you're unable to attend work for any reason, we ask that you give us at least four hours' notice before your shift begins. But of course, the more notice we get, the better. Now, you'll be working with us on a part-time basis, so you'll have to fill out a timesheet each week. You need to complete this daily. Then, at the end of the week, ask your supervisor to sign it and email a copy to your manager by 5 p.m. on Friday. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Right, next. Accepted standards of behavior. It may seem obvious, but work isn't the place for silly behavior. In our industry, we can't have people fooling around, especially with the equipment and machinery we have here on site. It's too easy for something to go wrong. There's also no place for swearing, bullying, or harassment at work. So if you're at all concerned at any time, please talk directly to your manager about this. Finally, what to do if there's a disaster of some sort? Um, sorry, no, dress codes first. Like all our office employees, you need to wear the standard white shirt with the company logo. You'll be provided with two of these. You wear your own trousers or skirt, which must be black, tidy, and smart. No jeans, and always black. In your role, you'll mostly be on reception. However, you may occasionally be asked to do something that requires you to go into the workshop area. In that case, you'll need to be decked out in proper PPE, personal protective equipment. Steel-capped boots, a vest, and, depending on what you're doing, gloves and a hard hat. The gloves are needed for any task that requires contact with dangerous chemicals, for instance. All the PPE is kept in the room before the workshop, which we passed through earlier. Right, now finally, if there's a fire or other disaster and the fire alarm sounds, you need to leave immediately. Don't try to go out the glass doors because they're automatic and may not be operating. The fire exit is through the door to the right of the main glass doors. When you exit, leave everything behind, including your bag, keys, and phone. People often fumble around wasting precious time when there just isn't time for that. So it's a company policy to take yourself to safety and nothing else. Once you exit the building, you need to make your way to the nearest assembly point which, from reception, is just over there, in front of the big oak tree in the car park. We have drills every six months, so that will give you a chance to uh, go through the drill. The last one was in January, I think, so the next one will be in a couple of weeks, early June, I believe. So that's my presentation. I know there's a lot to take in, but look, if there's something you don't understand, just ask. Everyone expects new people to ask questions, so don't be shy. Ask away. Right, I'll take a few questions now, and then I'm going to hand you over to Steve, who will give you an overview of the company's hazard management plan. Although you're working on reception, which should be relatively free of hazards, you need to know the process for identifying something that could cause harm. That is, if you notice a hazard in the workshop or office areas. So. Any questions on what we've covered so far? 
That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a conversation between two teachers who are making plans for the new semester. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi Hannah, how's it going? Are you finding your way around? Yes, slowly. It'll take a while before I've met everyone and I've got the hang of things. You'll be fine in a few days. It just takes time. So for today, let's just go over the basics. Now you've already got the syllabus for the semester. Yes, I got that from, I think her name is Maureen, the coordinator for the department. Yes, and remember that the syllabus isn't set in stone. We can make alterations to suit our students, but you'll have to tell her about any alterations we make so she can put it in the records. For example, if we see that our students need more work with writing, we can add some supplementary material. Okay, fine. So, what about assessment? Do we design our own tests? No, you don't need to worry about that. But we do need to design a written assignment task for them. When the time comes, you can find examples from past years in the secretary's office. Oh, the secretary. That's Paul, isn't it? I met him earlier today. No, Paul is our assistant classroom coordinator, and he can give you a hand with finding the books and supplies. The secretary is a young man named Jason. You may not have met him yet. He has a small office near the door just over there. It's really too small because it's very crowded with stuff. Can you see all those filing cabinets? Oh, yes. I was wondering about those. That's his office. Those cabinets contain all of our previous papers, test results, student assessments, and things like that. I'll introduce myself when I see him later on. Yes, he's really nice. Okay, so we have your attendance list here. Let's see. Good, it looks like you'll have a really nice group. William usually does the class lists. He's very good at it. I see you have about 10 new students. So you'll have to make sure that they receive the orientation materials and know the basics about the school, where things are, who to go to for help. Yes, I was told that I should speak to, um, Kelly about that. Is that right? That's right. She's in charge of pastoral care, and she'll make sure you have everything you need to pass on to the new students. I think she'll give you a copy of some stuff for yourself, too, like maps of the school and a timetable. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. The syllabus itself doesn't have firm dates for assessment and tests and homework, so I think it's a good idea to hash some of that out today while we're both here. Yeah, for sure. I imagine that we'll have to give the students some sort of introduction in the first week. Yes, you'll give them the course overview on the first day, and that includes information about what they will be doing when, and the due dates for all their assignments. 
OK. So how many assignments are there? Two, though we also do some quizzes in class. But before the first assessment, we always give the students a chance to ask questions and ask for help if they need it. So in week four, we need to schedule brief one-to-one -one progress meetings. Do we do this in class time? Yep. It'll actually only take a morning. You spend about 10 minutes with each student while the others are doing self-directed study. But we want to make sure that the first assignment is due a week or two afterwards. Ideally, they will have started that before the meeting. So what do you suggest? Week five for the first research report due date? Maybe week six is better, right in the middle of the semester. OK. So do we meet them again individually once we've graded their assignments? Not exactly. We will meet with them again, but later in the semester, just to give them some feedback and suggestions for improvement if needed. It's best done a bit later, a few weeks before the final exam. Which is... Week 12, right? Yes. It's in the last week of the semester, but not on the Friday. It's usually on the Thursday. We usually try to keep the last day free for a class activity, to let the students unwind a bit after the exam. Sounds fun. The weather should be nice by then, too. Maybe a picnic outside. Yes. Or we can even take them out to an event or an attraction. Last year we went to the aquarium just down the road. So, how about the marking of the exam? Well, we usually take one day in the week following the final test, usually the Monday or Tuesday, to grade the exams. We all come in and grade the papers together in the common room. That way, if we have a question about a certain answer or grade, we can get advice from each other. That's a great idea. It'll really help me as I'm doing it for the first time. Yes, even people like me who've been doing it for years find it helpful. I see here on the syllabus that the students can't access their results online until week 15. That's three weeks after the exam. That's rather a long time to wait. Well, it's actually the week before that when the students receive their final marks. But we don't enter them onto the computer until the following week because we want to make sure they're correct. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk on the topic of driverless cars. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. Today's talk is about motor vehicle technology of the future and in particular about driverless cars. So first, what is a driverless car? This is not a simple question and the British automotive industry has set five levels of driver control on the route to truly autonomous vehicles. Level zero, or driver-only, cars are what most of us are operating right now. Um, by that I mean we control the car by operating the pedals and the steering. And if we lose concentration or fall asleep, we're in big trouble. However, our current level zero cars already contain sophisticated mega-computers. Did you know? 
there are over 70 small pieces of software in your car. They control the accelerator, the brakes and lots more. Yes, you have to press the pedals, but after that the software takes over to actually operate the vehicle. OK, so now Level 1, or assisted, cars are already on the market. So what's different about these cars? They tend to have computer control assistance for parallel parking or electronic braking systems. Some companies are also making level 2 or partially automated cars. They have functions like adaptive cruise control and lane keeping. They can change their speed to match the car in front of them, so they can operate in heavy traffic. However, drivers still need to monitor carefully and be ready to take over if necessary. Now, uh, note that higher levels are not yet available for commercial sale. But Level 3, or conditional automation vehicles, will in theory be able to perform highway driving without the need for input from you, the driver. Well, not totally. They might need to ask the driver to take over in difficult situations, giving sufficient notice so that he or she is ready to resume control. So you can't go to sleep. So, what's the next step in this gradual process of developing automated vehicles? Yes, Level 4, or High Automation Vehicles. These cars may not have pedals or a steering wheel at all. Can you imagine that? They will be restricted to city environments, but in other ways are not so different from Level 5 cars, which will be fully automated in all situations. In this science fiction future, the driver may get into a vehicle, program it, and then sip coffee, sleep, or check the internet while the car propels him safely to his destination. Ah, well, of course, there's intense competition among the automotive industry to be the first to produce and test a workably robotically controlled car. But these cars are nowhere near ready for open road driving. They can only operate on roads that have been extensively computer mapped and they're very inflexible at dealing with anything unexpected, like new stop signs, for example. Let's see. Other technological issues for some models include problems with operating in some weather conditions, such as rain and snow. However, many insiders agree that these problems will eventually be solved, and that the biggest hurdle is getting the driving public to accept the idea. UK and US surveys in 2012 showed that somewhere between 37 to 49 percent of people would be comfortable owning one of these cars. However, at this time, only 22 percent of Germans were positive and 24 percent were hostile about the idea. A more recent international survey in 2015 indicated that 33 percent would like to own an autonomous vehicle but most respondents still wanted to be in control of their car. Right, so another issue for the consumer is cost, though this could be offset to some extent because of lower insurance premiums. People may be nervous about autonomous cars, but, you know, the facts speak for themselves. Uh, it's estimated that 90% of all car crashes are caused by drivers making mistakes. In 2014, in the USA alone, nearly 33,000 people died in cars. Driverless cars could hugely reduce that number. Some people estimate a 99% reduction in car accidents, but that would require 100% of cars to be robot-controlled. So what about the transition period? After all, whenever it begins, this change can't happen overnight. For many years, both human and computer-controlled vehicles will share our roads. Motorway driving is relatively predictable, but as we know, most cars are driven in complex situations in crowded cities. Even human drivers struggle to make split-second decisions in these situations. How can a driverless car be programmed to deal with crazy driving? But 
What's the biggest dilemma? It's an ethical one. How can we program a driverless car to make a choice in cases where an accident is inevitable? Should the car be programmed to choose the lowest number of injuries or to protect its driver first? This issue is not trivial and it could cause a big delay in the introduction of the new technology. Nevertheless, this change will surely come. The potential advantages are just too great. As well as slashing the road toll, the cars will potentially minimise road congestion because robot cars will be able to travel much faster and closer together than we do on our current road networks. Eventually, this will reduce driving time and thus increase our productivity. Fuel costs will fall with more efficient consumption patterns, but I suspect driving won't be as much fun. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. Don't forget to comment, like, and share our video.